Welcome. I am Rabbi Joanna Samuels. I am very proud to be the CEO here at Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. I am five foot four, have brown hair that's down to my shoulders, need a haircut, and I'm wearing blue eyeglasses. And I think that I am in the kindest and best room in New York City right now. It gives me great pride to commence the 15th annual Real Abilities Film Festival, colon, New York. <laughs> a festival where we present award-winning films by and about people with disabilities, bringing the community together to explore, discuss, embrace, and celebrate the diversity of our shared human experience. The JCC could not be more proud to have been the home to this festival for the last 15 years. <laughs> to, ex <laughs> to experience its growth and evolution, creating a truly inclusive environment dedicated to celebrating the lives, stories, and artistic expressions of people with disabilities. Our goal is to make this our most accessible festival ever both in person and in virtu virtually, where so many people will be joining us over the next many days. This festival is for everyone. As a community center, we love experiencing not only how this festival brings the disability community together, but builds bridges between all of us. I extend my profound thanks to the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment <laughs> who do the hard work to continue to prioritize accessibility and who champion inclusion in all ways. They have partnered this year not only on the festival, but on the Film Industry Summit that will be running on Monday and Tuesday. It is now my honor to welcome to the stage the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, Christina Curry, and the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, Anne Del Castillo. Okay. <laughs> Good evening to everyone. Wait, you're signing, so I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> Have to remember that. As Commissioner of New York City's office, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, it is my great pleasure to be here today with all of you. I really need to stop signing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> just a little bit nervous because when I know someone deaf is here, I just start signing. So, <laughs> so thank you. So let's go back a little bit. So I'm happy to be here at the Real Abilities Film Festival. The Real Abilities Film Festival is a celebration of the power of cinema to tell the lives and stories of people with disabilities, of all disabilities. We are grateful to the organizers, the volunteers, and participants of Real Abilities Film Festival for their commitment to making this city more inclusive and welcoming for all people of all disabilities. So, thank you, right? So we here at the NYC Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, MOPD, are proud to support this incredible initiative. And on behalf of the mayors of the city of New York, we are presenting this citation. Thank you. Yes, please. We're presenting this citation to Isaac and to the Real Abilities Film Festival. So thank you. <laughs> It 
It's a very long citation. We're not reading it right now, are we? Thank you. Thank you. And now, Anne, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Curry. Um, I practiced a sign, I, which I feel like I just want to do, if that's okay with you. Um, if I remember it, good evening. Right? Close. It's a little stuttering. Um, and welcome. Uh, I, I'm, I, oh, I should identify myself. Um, I am 5'1", that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> um, I have short black hair, um, and I'm wearing a green dress. Um, uh, I want to, first of all, just acknowledge um, and thank Joanna Samuels, who actually I have a history with. We worked together at the Educational Alliance many moons ago, and so it's such a treat to be here with her um, tonight. Um, uh, I also just want to, again, thank Commissioner Curry for, um, for joining us at the festival this evening and just for our partnership and collaboration as uh, we at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment continue to work towards um, inclusivity and ex accessibility uh, in the media and entertainment space. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my former uh, colleague, uh, commis uh, former Commissioner Calise, who is also here uh, tonight. <laughs> Um, and I just want to congratulate um, Isaac Zablocki, the festival co-founder, Ravi Terjman, uh, interim director of Real Abilities. I also want to congratulate Tony Kutzer from CODA, um, who's with us tonight. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the director of tonight's opening night film, Juan Felipe Zuleta, um, uh, with his, who will be premiering his film, Unidentified Objects. And finally, congratulations to all of the filmmakers and talent who are here tonight, whether your films are on the screen or you're working on films um, and telling these really important stories about the community. Just a little bit about the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. For those of you who might not be familiar with us, we work to support, promote, and grow New York City's creative sectors. Film, television, theater, music, advertising, publishing, live performance, digital media, and video games. Um, together, these sectors represent close to $150 billion in economic activity, which is nearly 10% of New York City's economy, and half a million jobs. Um, but more important, um, these sectors represent uh, the heart of New York City. They define New York City as a global creative capital. They're why people want to live, visit, and work in New York City. Um, and for our part, uh, one of the primary drivers of our work is really to increase access and opportunity for New Yorkers um, so that our industry really reflects the true diversity of our city. Um, this is particularly important to our mayor, uh, who isn't shy about speaking about his own um, struggles with dyslexia. So this partnership with Real Abilities is critical to our work um, and our efforts in this area. We are so proud to continue our long-standing partnership with the festival, which I think began five years ago, roughly. Um, yeah, I think it might have started with the 10th anniversary. <laughs> um, and we're especially delighted that this year, on the occasion of their 15th anniversary, we are expanding, um, working with them to expand the Industry Accessibility Summit, um, as Joanna mentioned. Um, beyond just discussions about film, but also to include discussions about live uh, uh, performing arts. Um, you know, really supporting these conversations around disability among stakeholders, not just from film, but from Broadway, off-Broadway, dance, and theater companies is really critical to ensuring that New York City's entertainment sectors are inclusive and accessible for all New Yorkers. Um, and so we hope you can join. It's a free event happening on Monday and Tuesday next week. Um, in closing, I just want to thank you again all for being here and enjoy tonight's program. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to the mayor's office and to our commissioners who are here tonight and everything that they do, not just for being here, but really everything that they do to work really closely with this festival to make it as much as possible. Um, thank you to Joanna and the leadership at the JCC for making Real Abilities its home for the last 15 years and fostering its mission. I'm Isaac Zablocki. I'm the co-founder and director of Real Abilities. Uh, I'll describe... 
I'll describe myself insecurely as uh, um, a very pale white man in a blue suit. I hope you can see me out there. Um, I am proud to be a member of the neurodivergent community, something I would have never said out loud if it was not for real abilities. We are honored to be a part of this revolution of disability de uh, depiction on the screen. And there is no greater symbol of that revolution than our opening night spot Spotlight Award honoree. You know him as the Academy Award winner of the Os Oscar winner, CODA, um, or possibly as the man who signed the national anthem at the Super Bowl this year. Um, yeah, there's, there's football fans here too. That's usually our, our audiences don't overlap like that. It, it is unbelievable. He is, I mean, I mean, um, Troy Kutzer has been at our festival a number of times. Um, last time he was here with Wild Prairie Rose. And before that, with his directorial debut, No Ordinary Hero, The Super Deffy Story. He's a legend of uh, stage and screen, starred in the Tony Award winning run of Big River on Broadway. And now, we see him walking down the street. We couldn't get him here tonight because people are stopping him for autographs. And this is the most beautiful thing. No one deserves that more. Please welcome Troy Kutzer. Wow. First of all, I just want to really thank Isaac and his fabulous team for making this a possibility. Congratulations on 15 years. It's quite a milestone. You should be proud. I feel very honored to accept this Spotlight Award. You know, every time I see disability, diversity, people in wheelchairs, wheelchair users. It, it reminds me of my dad. I feel like he's here because my dad also used a wheelchair. He was in a car accident. He was the best signer, but then he became paralyzed from the neck down. And that really taught me something about what it's like to be disabled. You know, sometimes I forget that I'm deaf. I forget that I have a disability. I feel like everybody else, right? And then my little brother, when he was four, he happened to fall into a swimming pool and he had brain damage as a result. And when I was seven, I had to figure out to how to deal with that. And then I was deaf, which I, you know, I saw him and what he had to go through in his travails. And then when I was 18, my dad was in his accident. And so both of them became disabled. And I never forget one evening, my dad asked me to come with him to visit my little brother in the hospital. And I said, sure, dad, and I'm driving him. You know, he's in the wheelchair in the back. We get to the hospital, we find my brother's room, and my dad's in the wheelchair seated there, and my brother's laying in the hospital with brain damage, but he's still breathing with the help of a machine. And I'm sitting there watching both of them. And I'll never forget that moment when my dad's hands were there and he reached out the best he could to try to touch his son's hand, who was my brother. And I saw this, but my brother wasn't able to do anything in response. And so I decided to grab my brother's hand and I grabbed my dad's hand and I linked them together so that they could touch one another. And with that connection, that moment really resonated with me because I knew that they both couldn't feel each other's hands touching, but I'm the one who felt it. And in that moment, it was so profound. And that really taught me how important it is that we value people, whoever they are. And that's what's so important about this Real, Abil Real Abilities Film Festival. You're bringing together your shared stories and that's really educational. It's quite unique. And I feel very proud to be here to accept this award. And I really hope that all of you share your stories. Uh, I'm deaf and I've worked hard for, what, 
54.75 years to get to this point as a young boy dreaming and dreaming and struggling. But there was nobody that was going to stop me. Nobody was going to take away my deafness. Nobody was, you know, I'm not broken. The problem out there is their perspectives, right? If we see ourselves as being disabled, but we get ahead despite perceptions, and the best way to do that is media representation. That's the best message we can share. To sh When I got to the Hollywood Award, I was able to educate people about the diversity in the disability community in, in its fullness as much as I could. And when I got that award, I said, this award goes to the deaf community, it goes to the CODA community, and it absolutely goes to the disability community. This is our moment. And again, I'm really looking forward to your stories because everyone has their story to share. Am I right? We don't just need these big corporations and these A-list actors with the big budgets. Disability is unique and rich. It's so much richer than what can be spent. And I just want to say thank you once again for having me. Thank you, the support. Uh, from this festival to really make this happen. Again, I feel so honored to be here. And I just want to say thank you. And before I close, I'm 6'1", my visual description. description. I have a hat, I have curly hair, I have a vest on, and I don't speak, but we have an interpreter here. He's from Pennsylvania, for those of you that are blind. <laughs> I've learned to reach out to everyone to give equal access. Thanks so much for accepting me as part of this. Enjoy your night. I love you. Thanks, everyone. It's not an Oscar, but hopefully he'll put it up there somewhere. I know. I know. <laughs> right next to the Oscar. <laughs> As I mentioned, um, uh, Troy's lifetime of work, and especially the recent recognition through CODA, is paving the way for a generation of filmmakers to make more inclusive films. The amazing films you're going to see this week are the product of this, of this movement that's been going on here from beyond 15 years that we've been here. After 15 years, it's amazing to see how far we've come, but how far our community still needs to go. And I want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the lifetime work of many of you that are out there and that are here with us tonight um, who have made this all possible. Um, I want to give a big shout out to one of the pioneers, Lorene Arbus. Are you still here, Lorene? <laughs> Lorene's up there. Instrumental in moving the, needle, moving the needle for disability and inclusion in film. But our work is not done, and um, this is really the moment to create that change. And if there's someone else who inspires me, it's uh, Judy Human, who passed away earlier this year. We will be honoring her on Friday night, um, and please join us for that. She taught us that it's not enough to win the case, and to get the Americans with Disabilities Act, we need to change the culture. And what better way than through film, right? Let this not just be a little blip on the screen of inclusion, but rather a social shift. Real Abilities is dedicated to continue to create change and inclusion, not just in our community, but across the country and around the world. We want to thank all of the amazing filmmakers. Many of them are here with us tonight who are joining us all week. They've come from near and far and um, allow us to take a, a deeper look at their work and the messages behind their films. Well, you have a little partner slide now, I believe. Um, I want to give a big thanks to my partner in crime. Where is Anita Altman? I saw her before. Anita Altman, <laughs> co-founder of the festival. And she brought this notion of partnership. These are our sponsors up there. She brought up this notion of partnership um, to the festival um, with amazing work, the, all these partners who are doing amazing work on the ground. So please check out all of our partners. Um, I want to give a very heartfelt thank you to our advisory council chair, Jordana Manzano. Yeah. 
who not only brings herself every year to the festival, um, but brings her whole family to work with us. Um, and I want to give a big thank you to all of our chairs of past who have brought us to this moment. Tonight, we are proud to present this year's co-chairs, Stephen and Sharon Bunkin, who are here with us. They've been supporters of Real Abilities for a few years now and um, fully recognize the value of our mission and have brought such kindness um, with every interaction. Please welcome Stephen and Sharon Bunkin. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. And, and this is such an incredible experience and we're so personally connected to the festival and everything that it represents. And true to its mission, the films are really changing perceptions. And as a parent, I do feel like the, all these films are, are sharing their role models and all the filmmakers are role models for our kids, which is really incredible. And um, we're, we're grateful for that. Yes, and we, um, we want to uh, express our thanks to Isaac, Ravit, Barry, the, the, other, the rest of the team at Real Abilities and the JCC and the volunteers who do such tremendous work to make this possible. And also recognize the individuals and organizations that sponsor this event. Um, we're grateful for your support and hope to continue to build on it in the years to come to for the next uh, 15 years. Thank you. Really, to create the groundbreaking accessibility that this festival offers, we need a lot of support and rely on your support. Um, those names were up there of many of our supporters. And please check them out online and check out all of our partners online as well. Um, we have over 40 events this week um, in five boroughs and beyond. Every film is followed by a conversation. Over 100 speakers will be joining us um, this week um, from all around the world. And we couldn't have done this without the generous support of a wonderful partnership that has grown over the years with our conversation sponsor this year, Pfizer. Thank you so much to the folks from Pfizer. Now I'd like to thank those who really make this festival happen here on the ground at the JCC, our talented AV team, Jeff Fontaine, Matt Temkin, Sam Brunswick, Bennett Leeds, and Spencer Brigman, a growing team who work tirelessly, tirelessly and go above and beyond um, with some leadership from Hillel Hyman, I think is still here. The unbreakable, that, that song has been in my head, the unbreakable Real Abilities team, um, many of you are, who work with us year round at the Carol Zabar Center for Film. Um, is Carol with us? She was supposed to be. Um, and I'll start with, uh, it's an amazing team. Some will come on board just for the festival. Lauren Mariah Stern, our film department associate director. She's there in red. Juliet Kleitz, our program associate here in the back. Who's Caroline Calandro, our file manager, who has worked tirelessly to get all these films up here in multiple formats. Ryan Botita, our program administrator. Ryan's back there. Connor Roach, our guest coordinator. Brett Strainier, our partner coordinator. Julia Betancourt, our production assistant. Um, our PR and publicists. We had a great piece today in Hollywood Reporter and on CBS, um, and many more coming. Um, ABC is covering interdepend interdependence PR, and our very own in-house Lauren Alexander. Where's Lauren? I want to give a huge, huge thank you now to um, a person who we could not do this festival without her, Barry Lovey. Barry is our major gifts officer. She truly makes this happen and she takes it on and wears it year round. Um, Melissa Regan, our senior director of institutional giving, um, has been with us for so many years and um, may, takes us to new levels every year. I want to thank. Thank you. Jessica Epstein and the design and marketing team that make this happen. Don't, don't worry, the, the orchestra will start playing soon. <laughs> they all do much more than just their titles. That's what's really important to say and deserve all the credit for making this happen. Um, I want to welcome back, after five years in exile, um, <laughs> Ravit Torjaman, our interim director. 
She's also the director of Real Abilities International, associate director of Real Abilities in New York. Um, and I have to say, has a rare combination of not just talent, smarts, and commitment, um, but beyond all that, and most importantly, I'd say, has the heart of a lion, and that is the most important thing. So thank you, Ravit, and welcome back. I'm gonna give a shout out to Yara Kedim, who was running Real Abilities for the last five years um, and is with us tonight. <laughs> And of course, to all of our volunteers, our volunteers who are here and make this happen and really support the festival. Um, and a big special thank you to Michelle Fag, our volunteer chair. A big thank you to our advisory committee members who champion the festival and provide invaluable guidance to make this happen um, throughout the planning process, and our film selection committee. They're all listed in the program, but um, these are amazing people who bring this all together. Without them, our incredible lineup of films would not happen. These accessible films, you can applaud them, yes, yes. <laughs> Half of them are here, that's why they're, they're being modest. Um, these accessible films will travel to over 20 cities and around the globe, as I mentioned, and will be in hundreds of corporations and educational institutions. Um, we're even gonna have some schools in here this week to enjoy the film, including Heschel, and my son's Heschel teachers are here, so <laughs> wonderful. These, um, uh, this year, we are proud to bring back, as mentioned, our industry summit, um, disability inclusion and equity in film and performing arts in partnership with the mayor's offices, and I'm, I'm making it shorter, and, and I wanna thank our consultant, Alexandria Wales, who helped us get that all together. I'm also excited to share, fabulous performer and advocate, I'm excited to share our comedy night is back at the Gotham. Gotham Comedy Club. It's gonna be funnier and more inclusive than ever. We have Pavar here to, with us tonight. Um, Maysoon Zaid was supposed to be here, but I haven't seen her, so not sure if she is. Um, and I wanna give a big thank you to our Comedy Night Chair, the very funny Lynn Bartner Wiesel. Thank you, Lynn. Note her outfit, the orange pants and the black. It's uh, <laughs> consistent with the Real Abilities design. Please join us this week for the week of programming from arts to family programs, book events, um, even a beauty panel, Sean. Um, spread the word and you are the reason why we have this festival um, and make it possible. And please, don't just come, bring friends. Tell as many as you can. And now we're up to tonight's film, we're there. Tonight's film, Unidentified Objects. We love films that are not necessarily completely about the disability, but rather are inclusive of disability in the fabric of the film. Tonight's film is a perfect example of that. Unidentified Objects fits into the road trip genre, um, which as you know is much more about, is less about the geographical destination and more about the character's inner journeys. Disability in the film helps nuance these characters and adds a level of complexity to the realities. I love a good New York indie, and that's what tonight's film is, and it's got a great edge. It's also an offbeat comedy, so don't be afraid to laugh. Unidentified Objects is most importantly about people and humanity and how we're all looking to belong. For We're all looking for community and friendship, and there's no better place to do that than right here. Um, so thank you so much for being here for this film. Thank you so much to the filmmakers. Our filmmakers are with us tonight um, and are helping us break taboos in Hollywood with depiction of disability. And, um, and if you wanna tell your friends, it's not only all of our programs are available virtually this, uh, this year, um, but this film will also be screening at the Museum of Moving Image uh, this weekend, and it will be released in theaters in June. If this is a hit in theaters, more movies like this will come out. Please, tell your friends. But after the festival. <laughs> after the screening, stay tuned, stay seated for a conversation. Yes, there's more. Um, with the actors, we have here Sarah Hay. Where's Sarah? Sarah's back there hiding. Matthew Jeffers. The great Matthew Jeffers, who you're gonna get to know, both of them very intimately in this film. Um, director Juan Philippe Zuleta, 
and they're going to be in conversation with really. I, I, I I'm going to trip up on his on the description because there's nobody more important to us um, in terms of really establishing the vision of this film. And if you don't like tonight's film, blame him. Um, he is uh, leads a program in Turner Classic Movies, also co-director now of DisArt, a disability-centered production company. Um, and um, it is Lawrence Carter Long. Thank you for being here. Thank you again to our conversation sponsors, Pfizer. After the Q&A, you will be rewarded with a, um, a reception upstairs, thanks to Chef's Kitchen. I want to thank our beer sponsor. There's non-alcoholic beer, too. Um, it's Industrial Arts Brewing, a New York brewery. So please check that out. Um, I want to thank everybody who has donated for the gift bags, um, which will be available also after the show. We wanted to give you some more leg room there. Um, and I'm giving a special thanks to John's Crazy Socks. You're gonna, I'm, wear, I'm wearing my John's Crazy Socks. There are real ability socks. That's how you know you've made it after 15 years. When you get a pair of socks, every time you put on your socks, you're going to think about real abilities. And if it's not the real ability socks, still think about us. Please silence your cell phones. Please mask for the safety of our community. And we will see you right after the screening. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, please um, welcome. I'm going to start with the director, Juan Felipe Zuleta. Where's Juan? <laughs> welcome. Amazing job. And now, two people who really need no introduction. Please welcome Sarah Hay and Matthew Jeffers. Sarah and Matthew. No flowers? <laughs> but more importantly, do you have a microphone? Hello, New York. Hello, Rilla Belita. Hi, fabulous people. Let's, let's give it up one more time for the film, shall we? So I got to tell you, Yitzi mentioned in my introduction that I've done some programming a time or two for Turner Classic Movies. And I'm a bit of a film nerd. And I got to tell you, when they sent this to me, I thought, well, I've seen every road trip movie ever made. Yeah. Oh, OK. Dramatic pause. Sorry for this, folks. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Just think of all those questions you have. Put them in your mind now. We'll continue. OK, we're going to continue. Hopefully, that captioning will come up soon. I'll try to talk slowly. My name is Lawrence Carter Long. I'm a middle-aged, skinny white dude who saunters with cerebral palsy. Don't suffer with cerebral palsy. Saunters with cerebral palsy. Just make that distinction. Uh, our esteemed panelists here, thank you so much for your work. It's fantastic. I was just saying, I thought when Yitzi sent this to me, I, I've seen road movies. I, I, I've seen Smokey and the Bandit. And Midnight Run and Rain Man and Little Miss Sunshine. I thought I knew what was coming, right? <laughs> Look, I could never, I could, I don't think I've ever been happier to be wrong. It's a remarkable achievement. So thank you all for this film. Uh, what do you have here? You've got bickering lesbian cosplayers. You got extraterrestrial cops, you got a platonic love story. 
right? And people who are trying to find their way either in this world or perhaps another one. Um, I wanted to start, Juan, by asking you about the origin of this film, how it got started, what you were taking when you wrote the screenplay, and how I can get some. So, so one, one thing, thank you so much for the praise. Um, the, the screenplay was developed with me and my, my writing partner, Leland. I give him actually a lot of the credit on the script. I, I was definitely very involved in the writing, and we, wrote, we developed it together. But Leland is, is, a, is a genius. He has a very warm and kind heart. And I think what brought us together to write this screenplay was, I think it all started when COVID hit. And mm. we found ourselves unemployed. We found ourselves with a lot of ideas, but not a lot of opportunities. And, and, and a lot of those ideas come from our heart. We care about stories about outsiders. Thematically, that's something that we, we, we really deeply care about and is the thing that has united us as storytellers. And, and we had, and a lot of those ideas really, I wish I could tell you it just, we, we had a lot of it written from before, but I think it was just the circumstances that we, we found ourselves when the world stopped. And, and it almost felt that the universe was telling us to tell this story. And, and we were just a medium uh, to bring it to life. Uh, and, and it come, actually came to us. We, we had, I had a sketch of a little person character. Sp so specifically. You knew you, spe you knew you wanted to write about a, a character who, who was a little person. Yes, that, that's something we had from before. That's the only element. And it was mainly really because from film school, studying, studying films and realizing that Diversity, like you realize, as a, as a Hispanic uh, filmmaker, uh, you realize the way characters are stereotyped in films. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, minority stereotypes, but when it comes to the disability community and specifically the little people, I realize most, like 99% of little people characters weren't even human beings on movies. Right. They, they were time bandits, uh, Ewoks. There's exceptions. You can, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. There's very few exceptions, but but they are mostly exactly like like they are. They were treated subhuman, and I and it really shocked me. It really, really shocked me, and it, and it really like moved me. And I was like, and and I had that sketch, and when COVID hit, uh, I pitched the idea to to Leland, and then we started. We found our heart. And that's how we started writing it. That's how we started. And, and Matthew was the first person we brought on the process. Uh, he's a, he's an, obviously as an actor, but also gave us a lot of permission, a lot of information. He's also a producer in our project. And for that, for for us, that was very important that he could also uh, guide us as we develop the story. Because obviously, it's not only about a little person, but there's a story, an experience that I don't have mm. um, that I need to respect. And you're an immigrant yourself, right, from Colombia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did that inform the outsidership and, and sort of the genesis of the story? So I feel um, as that our movie, we talk about our movie as a movie of characters who live in liminal spaces that don't have a place in the world, that are not n nor here nor, nor there. And, and that's also why there's a border crossing in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, because that border of where you draw the line, where you are, where you belong, it's it, at the heart of the theme of the story. So my, my, my experience as an immigrant, even like my English is much better now, but when I arrived to the US 11 years ago, it was way worse and, and it wasn't as, sh as it was so, so it's kind of like you all of a sudden, you feel like you have a disadvantage and, and you have to make up for it somehow. Um, so I feel that's kind of how uh, I, I started relating to that outsider experience uh, as a storyteller, just pitching a movie to American producers or or things like that. It's just it's just not the same because I uh, so so it kind of like that's how it went in, and and I think I developed an empathy and a and a sensibility for people who lived uh, who in the fringes, and I and I tried to try to understand and l hear them out more than what I would have ever done if I had just stayed in Colombia. And 
as an outsider, right, you, and it's, it's sort of one of the themes of the film, you have to work harder, right, because you're trying to fit in, and that can get exhausting. Um, since Juan mentioned that you were the first person sort of on board with the film, I wanted to come to you, Matthew. Um, very relatable, yet defying those expectations, right? This, this character is not a garden gnome, not an Ewok, right? A real person, flesh and blood, 3D, right? And I wanted, you, you mentioned that you were more than an actor, that you came on board as a producer and, and as um, an actor, of course, and, and uh, uh, sort of consulting. I know you've done a lot of work around representation. Why is it important to you that writers, producers, directors include disabled people in the conception and the store of the story and really work to get those details right, those lived experiences right? Why is that important to you? Um, thank you. Um, representation matters. Um, I uh, believe a quarter of the population uh, has identifies as having some sort of disability, and yet we, we really only see roughly 5% of the characters on screen be, uh, being portrayed as, <coughs> uh, as people uh, with disabilities. So the first thing that I would offer is uh, it's proven that as audience members, uh, they are more likely to engage with a show for longer if they identify with someone that they see on screen. If they see a character on screen that, that, that mirrors them in some way, that, that they feel seen, uh, it's, it's more likely that they'll remain engaged with the show. So from a commercial standpoint, you know, the industry as if they don't have enough money, they stand to make billions and billions of dollars more by authentically like bringing authentic stories to life because there is an entire community of which we are um, that uh, has so many beautiful stories to share that the general population is incredibly interested and totally in the driver's seat to become engaged with and, um, and become fans of. And from a personal angle, I studied acting at Towson University. I'm from Baltimore, and uh, I was a homebody, so I, I never wanted to go far away from home, and so I went 15 minutes down the road. And I studied acting there, and it was just, ha it ha happened to be at the time when Peter Dinklage was experiencing this meteoric rise in Game of Thrones. And so I would go to acting class in the morning, and I would come home, and I would sit on my uh, sofa, and I would turn on Game of Thrones, and suddenly, I had this road map laid out before me where I could see that, okay, if I take what I learned in acting class, and I moved to New York, and I tried very hard, I didn't know if it would happen. I didn't know if it would happen, but I knew that it could happen because I got to see the extraordinary work of Peter Dinklage in Game of Thrones. So because somebody else did it, right? You looked up there on the screen, you flipped on HBO, yeah. and you could see it, you thought, whoa, maybe I could do that too. Look, That's see a possibility. seeing is believing, period. You know, y there's, a, there's, a, there's a reason why videos, seeing videos hold so much power. Um, seeing is believing, and it, it allowed me to. It allowed me to believe. I wrote my senior thesis on Peter Dinklage. I mean, I was I was profoundly inspired by his work, and um, and it, it kind of to allude what you said in the beginning of creating a three dimensional character that that isn't the garden gnome or the or the, or the elf or you know the stereo the characters. Um, this guy was incredibly flawed, right? And you and yet you rooted for him, right? He was this kind of bastard child who who. Um, 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 was this kind of sex addict and drank too much, but but had a real beating heart, and uh, he, you know Peter, he, he made you fall in love with him, and I fell in love with him, and um, and and you know he was top billing on on you know arguably one of the greatest shows in the history of television. So, sex uh, symbol, their murals, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, buildings. a hundred percent. So, um, so yeah, it's. Um, it's it's it, it the industry. Bertolt Brecht is a very famous playwright uh, who said that 
art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. And uh, it is that hammer that that the industry wields. The industry wields incredible power to change lives in profound ways. And I think the industry is um, on the precipice in the past few years of bringing to life um, these marginalized communities, people on the fringes, CODA, right? Great example of making history um, and you know, watching that has changed lives, right? Troy, you've, you've changed lives. And so, but you were given the, the opportunity, right? You didn't write CODA, you brought CODA to life and, and gave it a beating heart. And so it's a team effort, right? I, I'm not talented the way Leland is or the way Juan Fe is. I can't write unidentified objects, but I can help on my end to bring that character to life. So that's why I love the industry so much is because coming from a, a sports background, uh, it is it is the team, the team, the team. There is no I in this industry, and the the most beautiful and powerful work comes from really fucking talented people coming together and making art. And it cannot be done alone. Right, and you. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen, and some other superlative yeah. that I. Wow. Oh, I I want to ask also, how many f bombs did you drop in the film? <laughs> Well, I just added another one, so <laughs> I don't know. Who we'll have an M&M jar in the lobby. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. Just to, just to clarify, I was I was brought on as a producer at the end at the at end, end at the yeah. end. Um, I w when I signed on, it was it was strictly to be. A, uh, but did you help inform? Yeah. Sort of the the character, right? The details. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's really important um, because if you get them wrong, right? I sort of move my legs when I sit right. into a chair, and if a character is portraying somebody with cerebral palsy and they don't do those little things, although CP has all these variations, I spot it and I go up, oh, too much muscle tone. I'm now, eh, eh. You can see when somebody's faking it, right? And, and so I appreciate that. Um, Sarah, so great work. I gotta tell you, normally abductions are depicted as something traumatic, right? <laughs> but Winona, she can't wait to get back, right? She, she says at some point she doesn't have to live in this world and it's pretty clear that she doesn't want to. I wanted to talk a little bit about your process and, and embodying that character, right? We've talked about perceptions of disabled folks and how sometimes those are skewed. Women in our society are clearly objectified, right? What clay did you use, right? What did you work with in sort of creating this character and, and the three dimensions that she has? It's actually interesting that you say three dimensions because when we were developing this character, we came up with three different versions of her throughout the film. And there was like a responsible grown-up version, a child-like version, and then what was the third one? Like a, like a really, really old version. Like oh, like a, like like a 90 something year old version. An, an older person. Wise or worn out? <laughs> a wise old person or a worn out old yeah, person? Yeah, just someone who has been through lived a lot. so much. Uh, lived someone who has a lot of life, life experience. A Li yeah. lot of life experience, okay. And my um, personal connection to it is that I spent the first 26 years of my life working towards being a professional ballet dancer. And um, when I was in school and growing up, I had pretty severe ADHD, but when I would get into a dance studio, I was like free and felt amazing. And um, what I learned through that experience of 25 years of ballet was that I never really wanted to do it. Mm. Um, I was sort of taught that I wasn't good at school. And so I was living this secondary life where everyone was looking at me like I was this magical princess and everyone was telling me I was so amazing, but I was really living in someone else's experience because when I stopped dancing and I tried acting, I felt for the first time like I actually was myself. Mm. Um, 
and my family was super supportive of me dancing and they you know they saw this little girl who was so talented so they kept pushing me and pushing me towards that direction and pulling me away from education mm. um, because they didn't want me to fail so her journey of trying to escape something and this feeling of being lost and not accepted and um, on this uh, kind of sad path that she's living was very relatable, even though from the outside it kind of looks like she's fine and has everything and I felt the same way. So it was easy to relate to her in that way. And sort of would turn that into the art, right? Because there's a lot of pressure there. And just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's necessarily what you enjoy or what, what you want to do or what you're meant to do. Or if you think you have to be some way or um, do something, you know, to prove to everybody that you're amazing or that you're capable of, of great feats, it, it doesn't mean that that's really the journey for you. Yeah, and so what are your hopes for this film? You've been touring around doing a, the festival circuit. What do you want to see? Um, an Oscar for Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> He's so good. I, I, don't have, I don't have formal training, and watching him and his process made me a better actor. Um, and also, you know, I... I did a lot of really amazing projects before this, um, and I feel very lucky that I've gotten to have a chance to perform. Um, but all of them had big budgets, and all of them had snazzy people in them, and after doing this project, I don't want to do any of that anymore. I want to do independent film with new creatives who are making movies that matter, and not just garbage for people to veg out to. <laughs> <laughs> so more weirdness, more uniqueness in the world. More weirdness, the better. Um, but my hopes for the movie is that we get a big enough audience that it can um, you know, spark a career opportunity for more people, um, especially you know, new directors, young directors. He, I, you had just graduated NYU when I met you and you're making this movie, and I just took a chance. You know, my manager took the submission, and he spelled my name wrong because his first language isn't English, and my manager said, maybe not this one. <laughs> and then I looked at the deck, and I was completely blown away by the visuals. It's like, why not give opportunity to new creatives and not shut them out just because you're some fancy agency or management company? It, I just yeah. want more opportunity for people like us. Fantastic. I, I got to give you props, by the way. Before I turn it over to the audience, I got to give you props for the little details. The pink Jeep, the phone booth in the middle of nowhere, the slug crossing the road. The, the that best was an accident. <laughs> that was that was a happy accident. The best use of Roy Orbison since Blue Velvet, I think. Um, um, and even ELO, just just great choices there all the way around. Um, audience, we've got some time left. How about you? Who wants to go first? We're going to pass the microphone. Yeah, I also want to give a quick credit to Masha Leonov, who is the producer of the film, who's here with us. Oh, woohoo! Thank you, Masha. None of these would happen without producers, so thank you, Mark. They keep, they keep the wheels going. <laughs> they keep the gas on the engine. One of the brilliant things of this film is how there are moments in the close-ups of stillness, and you see what the characters, and you can connect to the characters very much one-on-one -on -one as an audience with the close-ups that you did. When you storyboarded this one, did you have those close-ups as part of the original, or was it once you saw how amazing Matthew and Sarah were that you knew that that was an avenue you could utilize more because of the performances they were giving. Because there are so many times when things could have been over-explained or been said in dialogue, and instead it was a close-up on one of you going through what you were going through as a character with no explanation, and yet we understood and heard very loudly when no words were being spoken. So I was wondering if that was something you had planned beforehand or just because you guys were so incredible that was something you, you added. 
So I think I think that's a great question, by the way. I don't think I've I've been in festivals for the past year and I've never gotten that question. Mm. Um, I think it's both. We prepared, uh, we shot the movie, most of the movie handheld, and we planned to be, be able to get really close to the actors. So we very we made a lot of planning around the lenses and the camera work, so that we could be intimate inside a car and we could feel like we were there with them. That being said, uh, the magic about making movies is that you have to be present. You have to absolutely be present and you have to absorb and connect and create an, en an energy and an environment where you you're, you're open for surprises. And, and I knew, I, I, I think a movie is 90, like 80% casting, 90% casting, having a good cast you can really shape a good movie, even if you have uh, an okay script. Obviously, if you have a great script, it's even better. But cast is, is massively important, so I knew, I felt confident with them going into the field that I had good actors. But absolutely, it wasn't until we were filming and I could see their chemistry and, and start seeing that I, I couldn't stop rolling. Like, I, I really felt even the moments of silence, sometimes we would just shoot those moments. I, even even in the goodbye scene when Matthew is playing Peter at the beach and he's saying bye to her, to his friend, um, to to Shay, and like and like just basically remembering her. Uh, she, he had a monologue in that scene, and we shot the monologue. But then I I picked him up and I told him, just sit down there and think about Shay, and I filmed him like just looking at the ocean and think and remembering somebody he loved, and, and he misses. And 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 I think so that's a powerful thing about cinema, is that is that sometimes you can tell more with just a, an image, than than with a monologue, and and I feel I I kind of knew that in theory, but not until you're present and you make yourself available for that, and then in the editing room you really push and really understand and really study the footage that you have, that that you build it. So so I think crafting a movie. It's nobody knows anything. You have to be present and you have to try everything and, 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 and their energy, their looks, their, their performances, their truth. They were very honest when they were playing those characters. Uh, that's what allowed us to, to feel that. Excellent. Other, oh, here in front. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I mean, it's so interesting what you said. Um, really helped me, Lawrence, with, you know, because I'm looking at this film and you think the protagonist has every reason to go to another planet, right? With everything, his reality is not pretty, it's not glossy, it's not extraterrestrial in any way. And I remember thinking as this was happening, when you're offering, you know, come with me, and the fact that you had no you didn't think about it. You didn't, you know, your character was pretty set on staying human, staying in his reality. And I thought that was such an interesting choice. But knowing this intention of, of embracing the humanity and being able to be messy and imperfect and still choose your life, I think is really powerful. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, to, I mean, just a, a really vulnerable performance, I think that gets us all thinking about what it means to be an insider, but still in our own lives, and still choosing, no matter how difficult our reality may be, still choosing to live that life. Um, so anyway, beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that this movie shows is there's a certain liberation that can come with embracing that outsidership. When you stop playing by their rules and start listening to your own heartbeat, right, and the things that make you tick, your own juice, um, then things can start to shift. That energy can start to go in a different direction. I read in one of the interviews in preparing for this, I think, Juan, you said that the character you play, Matthew Peter, is a lighthouse. And, you know, brightest, most beautiful lighthouse in the world, right? But located, yeah, but has no electricity. And I think one of the, so what good is a lighthouse without electricity? 
right? And, and I think what this movie shows beautifully is that we can all be the electricity and the juice for each other. And we can help each other shine. And I think this movie does that beautifully. So thank you once again, everybody, for all your work. Thank you. Ma Matthew, you have, you have a tattoo of a lighthouse. You have a tattoo of a lighthouse. Yeah, but on, on our first day, um, it was Zoom. It, we shot in August 2020, it was, it was Zoom. And on our first day, we com came up with that analogy. And um, after rapping, um, I, I got a tattoo of a lighthouse on my thigh. <laughs> With, with cotton candy, blues and yellows and pinks. <laughs> That's commitment. Um, folks, first of all, um, uh, our friend uh, Simi Linton had mentioned that this is the hottest party in New York. Um, come celebrate with us upstairs in the lobby a little longer. We're here all week, so please join us and please tell your friends. Give it up for these amazing filmmakers and for Lawrence Carter Long. And help, help us spread the word. We're here all week and would love you to join us for more. Thank you all so much. Yes, theatrical release in June. Correct? Yes. June 2nd, right? Yes, yes we're, our movie is going to be on, on streaming platforms on June 9th. And it's going to have a limit, limited theatrical release, first week of June. Uh, if you like it, please spread the word. Word of mouth is our, be our best ally for small indie films. So I, I do the sh shameless plug. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all. Don't forget to grab a gift bag, too, on your way out. Thank you. <laughs>